Welcome to our first day of discussion on Laurie Health Anderson Speak. You should have read up through third marking period, which is page 137. Predictably, I am going to say that if you have not read that far yet, please pause this video and come back again when you have. Thank you. You may already know this, and you may not, but this is not something about which there should be any confusion. So briefly, here are three myths and three facts about rape. Myth number one, the person fails to say no, or silence means yes, or no may mean yes if it's said in a certain way, or it's ambiguous, really. It's hard to know what's no, what's yes. Fact number one, no is no. Rape is sexual intercourse with another person without that person's consent, period. If you have sexual intercourse with another person and you do not have their consent, that is rape, period. And there's nothing ambiguous about it. If you're not sure, ask. There are two very good examples from the novel. In fact, uh, one of them occurs right near the end of the reading for today. Uh, and that is Melinda at the party um, on pages 133 to pages 136. Um, she says no, quite explicitly. There's another example later in the novel when Melinda imagines herself receiving counsel from Oprah Winfrey. That's on page 164. Incidentally, and you may have already seen this, but there is a great video by Britain's Thames River Police uh, which I will link to below, in which it talks about consent in terms of offering someone a cup of tea. It's a British video, so, you know, tea. Anyway, check it out. I will put a link below. Myth number two. Men are at the mercy of their sexual drives, and therefore they rape when they are overly frustrated or when the opportunity arises. That's also false. Fact number two. Rape is a crime of power, not of desire. Rapists often speak not of their sexual arousal or their attraction to their victims, but rather of their desire to hurt or to dominate them. It's about power. It's not about desire. Myth number three. Rapes typically occur on dark, deserted streets between strangers. Fact number three. In fact, a majority of rapists and victims know each other. Rapes often occur within the home. Many women experience date rape or acquaintance rape. In other words, you're more likely to be raped by someone you know. Yes, I'm aware that this is a literature class, but given the trauma at the heart of this book, I just wanted to make sure that you know all this before we start. And that's why I am beginning with this. Information as context for our reading. Why is Melinda reluctant for most of the novel to speak about being raped? I know it's a heavy question, but it's a really important question. And so I want to start with it. Why is she reluctant to speak about it? And you might press pause here and write down a few examples from the book, and there are a number of examples from the book where she indicates why she doesn't want to talk, why she does not want to speak. Just press pause. And here is a moment where I wish we could have this conversation in person, because Anderson is so good at representing why Melinda is reluctant. And I know in person, you would point to passages like these. On page 51, quote, I want to confess everything, hand over the guilt and mistake and anger to someone else. There is a beast in my gut. I can hear it scraping away at the inside of my ribs. Even if I dump the memory, it will stay with me, shaming me. All right, I misread the last word or the second to last word there. 
it is it will stay with me staining me not shaming me but i think i misread that last word because this is indeed a passage about shame and it's true um, it's a very realistic feeling for someone who has survived rape is to feel shame pages 81 to 82 quote the whole point of not talking about it of silencing the memory is to make it go away it won't I'll need brain surgery to cut it out of my head. So denial is another reason that Melinda is reluctant to speak. Also a common response. Another common response is a fear of not being believed. For example, on page 114, she says of her parents, or rather she thinks of her parents uh, and says to us, quote, would you listen? Would you believe me? Fat chance. So I call your attention to those passages because her feelings are very realistic. Women often blame themselves because perhaps they went out with the man who raped them or they feel guilty because they think they could have prevented it or just know that others will doubt their claims. Why do they believe these things? Well, those cultural myths that we started out with, right? Uh, those cultural myths have power and they influence the way that we see ourselves. And this is why rape is an underreported crime women often hesitate to report the crime to police. And if you will forgive the editorial comment here, this is why I find the Me Too movement so remarkable. Women are not just naming those who have harassed them and in some cases raped them. They are naming very powerful people who have done this. I mean, the courage that that takes, I, I can't even begin to imagine. It's, yeah, it's, it's amazing. Back in our first class, Remember that first class? It's on video, so you can always go back and see it again. Back in our first class, I said I would introduce you to different ways of interpreting literature. And so, as we move forward in our discussions of speak, a few words about, and some questions that draw upon, formalism and feminism. Ways of reading that we have already been doing in this class, even though we have not identified them as such. Formalism is Close reading, it's the insistence on the keen attention to the text itself. Diction, tone, metaphor, simile, image, symbol, allusion, all that stuff. I will define some of these formal literary terms down below this video for your reference. And that approach is all well and good. It's particularly good for this novel as we will explore in a moment, that close attention helps us understand how a novel such as Speak speaks to us. But we do not read in a vacuum. For one thing, there's just not enough room to get yourself and the book in here. For another, context. We read in a larger world and that world shapes the creation of the original text and our response to that text. We cannot deny that larger context. Well, we could deny that larger context, but we would miss a lot. A feminist close reading would put gender at the center of its analysis. So a feminist close reading of The Catcher in the Rye might call out Holden for his emotional exploitation of female characters and for his somewhat narrow view of women in general. Or it might arrive at a very different reading Holden is, after all, unusual in paying a prostitute to talk to him. In other words, there is not just one way to do feminism. We might place gender at the center of our analysis and arrive at quite different conclusions about what a book means. So, you now have a name for some of what we have already been doing. A feminist close reading... See what I did there? I combined formalism and feminism. A feminist close reading places gender at the center of its analysis. The disreputable history of Frankie Landau Banks explicitly does this. The characters actually talk about feminism and about challenging the patriarchy. They do feminist analysis in the work itself, which in our questions we talked about. There are many different definitions of feminism. It's not a monolith. Different feminists do feminism differently. 
For our purposes, let's define it as a critique of the power relationship between the genders and the insistence on equality. Neither gender should dominate. In case there's any mystery here, thanks to patriarchy, men tend to be afforded more power. Patriarchy is a way of organizing a society in which men hold the power. It's also a term that, that names those structures of power that favor men. Legally, socially, throughout daily life. Structures that remain invisible to men. We should mention here that I am a straight, white, cisgendered male. I have all of the unearned privilege. I didn't ask for that unearned privilege, but I have it. And I'm naming this as unearned privilege because that's what it is, and because unearned privilege tends to remain invisible to those who have it. If you have this sort of privilege, privilege you didn't ask for, privilege that benefits you, it's just normal. It's just how the world works for you. But of course, that's not how the world works for everyone, and that is not fair. That tilts the playing field towards those with privilege. So that's why I'm naming it. Um, and that's one of the things that patriarchy does. It names a particular kind of unearned privilege that men have, and because it is an unearned privilege, it is also a means of oppression. That unearned privilege depends upon other people being denied those same privileges, those same rights. We will talk more about this in future classes, but for now, the important thing to keep in mind is A, privilege tends to remain invisible to those who have it. B, privilege, unearned privilege, also depends upon oppression. And C, it's complicated. It's entirely possible that you have some kind of unearned privilege, but not other kinds. You know, you may be male, but also poor, right? Identity is complicated. All right, let's get back to speak. I'm recording this in summer. At this point in the video, I am admitting that deciding to wear a blazer in summer was probably a mistake. And in our discussion, we will draw upon close reading and on feminist analysis. We're going to do this in small groups. And as usual, the number of the question corresponds to the number of the group that you are in. Question number one, pages 100 to 101, the section titled Code Breaking. This offers advice on how to read the novel. It's all about symbolism, says Hair Woman. Every word chosen by Nathaniel, every comma, every paragraph break, they were all done on purpose, says Melinda. I can't whine too much. Some of it is fun. It's like a code, breaking into his head and finding the key to his secrets. Like the whole guilt thing. Of of course, you know the minister feels guilty and Hester feels guilty, but Nathaniel wants us to know this is a big deal. If he kept repeating, she felt guilty, she felt guilty, she felt guilty, it would be a boring book and no one would buy it. So he planted symbols like the weather and the whole light and dark thing to show us how poor Hester feels. So what Anderson does there is she invites us to think symbolically about her own novel and she does it very cleverly, right? She both lays out the way to do that and pokes fun at it at the same time. It's kind of advice couched in irony. After all, Melinda speaks in ways that do not involve words. Why, for instance, does she dwell on planting flowers? We'll see a lot of references to that, not only in the part that we've read, but in the rest of the book on page 126. If the rose is picked, the plant grows another one. It needs to bloom to produce more seeds. So why flowers? Why do those keep recurring? Why is it significant that Melinda be assigned to draw a tree and thus spend the book struggling to create that tree? How do her representations of the tree reflect her emotional state? Cubism. 
why all of the references to cubism. I have linked to a reproduction of Picasso's Girl with a Mandolin. Take a look at that painting and think about how it represents its subject. What does it show you of that subject? How does it show that subject? And why might cubism speak to Melinda's state of mind? So pick any one of these, the flowers, the tree, the cubism, and think symbolically about it. And draw upon examples as you do so. And then for your second post in this group discussion, respond to a group member who picked a different symbol and place your analysis in conversation with that other group member's analysis. What do your symbol and that other person's have in common? Where do they differ? Question number two. The novel alludes to Maya Angelou on pages 50, 130, 151 to 152. Lewis Carroll's Alice's Adventures in Wonderland, page 144. Nathaniel Hawthorne's The Scarlet Letter, pages 100 to 102. And it alludes to Emily Dickinson's I Heard a Fly Buzz When I Die and several other works. Where in particular does it allude to Emily Dickinson's poem? It alludes right on page 101, quote, the fly buzzes a farewell buzz and dies. So I will reproduce the full text to Emily Dickinson's poem below. I will also read it to you here above. I heard a fly buzz when I die. The stillness in the room was like the stillness in the air between the heaves of storm. The eyes around had wrung them dry and breaths were gathering firm. For that last onset, when the king be witnessed in the room, I willed my keepsakes, signed away what portion of me be assignable. And then it was there interposed a fly with blue uncertain stumbling buzz between the light and me. And then the windows failed. And then I could not see to see. So group two people, what meanings do you derive from this poem? And yes, I know Emily Dickinson's poetry, when you first look at it, may seem a little bit opaque, but it really isn't. The more you think about it, the more you look at it, the more you track what's going on in it. And then, group two people, why to speak allude to this particular poem? And you might speculate on the significance of that allusion or of any of the other allusions in the novel. At the start of this question, I mentioned Maya Angelou, Lewis Carroll, Nathaniel Hawthorne. What themes or ideas do they explore? Question three, which is a pair of parallel questions, I guess. How would you describe Melinda's tone? That is, her attitude towards what she talks about. And what's the effect of that particular tone? How does Melinda's humor help her process her experience? Whether that's simply the daily indignities of high school or the trauma of surviving rape or anything in between. And if you're looking for places to begin to think about humor, you might consider Puns and games with language, which are throughout. But for example, there's high school on page 52. There's biz ed teachers on page 74, and many, many others. Speaking of phys ed, there are all the titles, right? Each section of her narrative has a title. One of those is phys ed. On page 18, there's, uh, on page 49, go fill in the blank. Um, there is uh, conjugate this on page 107. There are all the team names. There are all the teacher names, the sometimes cruel nicknames that she gives the teachers. Well, that's the end of our first day of discussion on Lori House Anderson's young adult classic, Speak. We'll talk more next class. See you then.